again, I'm Jason O'Dell, and this is Discovering Oregon. Um, I want to I want to introduce. Uh, we take this moment to introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Jason O'Dell. Um, my website is luminescentphoto.com, and uh, I've been friends with Rick Walker uh, since oh about 2003. I think we met on um, the Niconians website, and. Um, I've been doing photography since I was a kid, and um, in 2010, um, I sort of made it my my business. And so um, I've been doing workshops, for example, with Rick since I think we did our first one in 2007. Um, and we host a, a podcast every week called the Image Doctors Photography Podcast. Rick, if you're if you're on the line, why don't you say hi and introduce yourself? Sure, and you certainly covered a little bit of it already, um, but like Jason, I've been involved in photography since I was pretty young, about 10 is when I started seriously, and at one point I worked in a camera store in college and taught, first started teaching photography classes then and have done it numerous times since, and uh, in fact, um, I think the way Jason and I met was he came on a workshop I was running up in Rocky Mountain National Park. So workshops are something that we both enjoy quite a bit. And yeah, we'll that was a little uh, bit about one that we have coming up soon. Yeah, that was this. 2004. Yep. <laughs> I think so. So, um, and you know, we've both taken a lot of, I, we're both primarily Nikon photographers, but Rick dabbles in a lot of different things. Um, I know that you've, you've shot medium format. We both shot film and slide film and print film in the past. Um, we both moved to digital. Oh, you were earlier than I was, but we both moved to digital by, I think by 2005, we were both pretty much full-time digital at that point. So we've been doing digital photography now for Oh, this will be 16 years for me, and probably a little more for you, Rick. Yeah, I would a couple think. more. Mm -hmm. And um, and we're both um, using a variety of things, including uh, lately the mostly the Nikon mirrorless system, but you know other stuff in between as well. So we're we're glad you all uh, came to join us this evening and take a little time out. Um, it's it's really great to have so many people um, interested in what we've been up to. So we want to talk, this is just sort of an overview today of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, just so many things to photograph in Oregon, and, and we've been there on numerous occasions, and it never gets old. It's always really great to go there. Um, so we're going to share some of our photos, but some of the places, some of the things we really like about Oregon include the Columbia River Gorge area, which is near Portland. Uh, there's tons of coastal towns along the Oregon coast, little fishing towns, um, beach towns. It's really, really nice. And then, of course, the beaches and the, the rock formations called sea stacks are just magnificent in Oregon, um, as well as a lot of state parks. And Rick and I talk a lot about you know, places to go and shoot that are sometimes a little less well known, but can be equally awesome compared to as compared to some of the national parks, which can just get overrun, especially recently with the, you know, everyone staying or <laughs> staying inside and staying at home and doing domestic travel. Um, there are so many state parks in Oregon. Um, we were talking today, there's only one national park in Oregon, right, Rick? Very true. Just Crater and that, Lake. That's Crater Lake, right. And then, so there's coastal Oregon on the west side, and then if you go over to the eastern side of Oregon, which I've actually not been to, it's totally different. Um, completely, you know, dry, arid. This is where the Palouse is. For those people who've heard about that area, where they have the 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 rolling uh, hill farmland, and um, pretty pretty interesting. So um, let's. We just want to kind of talk about these in a little more detail. Um, and talk about some of our shots that we've gotten there over time. And the first first place is um, the uh, Columbia River Gorge. And uh, I think I'm going to let you talk about these, Rick. Sure. Yeah, and just one other thing I should have mentioned is I'm actually originally from Oregon, and that's where I was born. That's where my family is from. And um, I've lived there several times. And I've also been back many, many, many times. And it's you know, a place that I just absolutely love and 
would always like to go back to again. So again, that's why we're kind of talking about this today. So the Columbia River Gorge, um, right up on the Columbia River, which is the border between Oregon and Washington, it's a really nice area. There are some gorgeous large waterfalls. Um, we'll show some pictures of those in a little bit, along with some really pretty cascades that you can find alongside the road and, and just go back into them and, and just play photographically. But it's along a, a stretch of historic highway, so it's not like you have a freeway right next to you. It's it's quiet and it's nice. And there are some locations, I'll, I'll forewarn people that are um, going there on their own, you have to be a little bit careful with some of the spots. There are some absolutely beautiful waterfalls that can be really treacherous, especially when there's rain and the trails are a little bit wet and muddy. Um, but fortunately, there are some that are really easy to get to, and those are the ones that we're going to be highlighting um, today. And as you would guess, doing water photography, you've got some fun opportunities to play around with creative effects. You know, primarily shutter speed is, is a good one. Um, one really helpful um, tool for shooting in these environments is a polarizer. And, you won't have a sky in the photo, it's not for that, but they're just absolutely wonderful for taking off the glare from the rocks, um, the vegetation, and really bringing out the color. If I hadn't had a polarizer on the shot there on the right, um, which is of a place called Lateral Falls, it just would have lost a lot of the color intensity. So it becomes a really important tool in that environment, along with a good tripod. And a really famous one that probably many people have seen photos of, it shows up on calendars uh, frequently, is Multnomah Falls, um, which is in the gorge. And one of the cool things about this spot is, first of all, this shot is just right off the parking lot, so extremely easy to access. And then you can actually take a trail up and cross the bridge and go back in further and photograph some other things. The classic shot, which is this one, is and extremely accessible. And you can walk up that bridge, right, Rick? Yeah, exactly. And then do some shooting from up there too. Right. This was from uh, when we went there in 2011, if I recall. And it was a little mm -hmm. bit rainy that day, so there wasn't a good sky, but it was beautiful for everything else and the long exposure was super easy to get. Yeah, and honestly in the gorge, this is what you want. You know, just the nice soft overcast light. Works great. And then Lateral Falls, close by there. I think this is one of your shots, Jason. Yep. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it's a really tall one. But then I think I used like a, I think I was using like a 70 to 200 or something. And I, I tried to do something different because every shot of the waterfalls tends to be portrait orientation or vertical <laughs> so so I was looking for something a little different and when I was going through my photos again this is from 2011 when we when we went there together last and you know it was a uh, interesting photo because again you know the 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 long-ish shutter speed you don't need terribly long shutter speeds to blur that that water um, I'm sure I had a polarizer on at the time um, but we were talking going through these photos earlier and uh this is one that i reprocessed in lightroom and i was just blown away by how much more color and, and clarity i could get out of it compared to what it started off as out of the camera so i was it was it was a shot that it was kind of marginal i thought before but um newer post processing tools really brought some stuff out on it yeah, and just to give you a sense of size, I mean, this isn't the complete waterfall in this shot, but Lateral Falls is about 300 feet high. So these are these are good-sized waterfalls. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then, then just uh, a shot of yours, yeah. Yeah, but, but this is another thing you can do. I mean, when you're in Oregon or any location, what we would go to, for example, um, you know, you've got the big waterfall, right? I mean, that's the obvious subject. But, 
you like to spend a little time doing other things. And some of the other things can be sort of close-ups, details, the water flowing along the cascades, the rocks, close-ups of the moss. There's all kinds of stuff to, to explore if you give yourself enough time in a location to kind of get into that groove. Um, I think most people will go to Oregon, they'll you know, you'll see one of these big waterfalls, you take your snapshot and you go back to the car, right? And you take your snapshot. Um, so one of the things we both like to do is after we get that primary, what you might call the hero shot, is to go back and look for other things. And most of this stuff was right accessible, you know, either on the trail or the side of the road. If I, if I recall, is that right, Rick? Yeah, yep, very close. Yeah. So, There's actually a nice area that just kind of goes up the, the hillside. Yeah, so lots of opportunities for stuff like this. And again, that polarizing filter or even uh, depending on the light. Usually if it's overcast, the polarizing filter is all you need to slow the exposure um, down a little bit. Um, but things like neutral density filters can be helpful too here. Moving on, um, when you go out away from... Portland and away from the Columbia River Gorge, um, there's just all these little coastal towns and there's fishing heritage. Um, and you can spend, most of these are small towns. You can just walk around their little downtown area, but there's all kinds of old weathered buildings. Um, those are some crab pots we photographed in a town of Newport back in 2011. Um, the colors of the ropes and the the, the floats, um, and there's there's lighthouses that you'll come across. Uh, so here's a photo of one of the lighthouses in Oregon that we we photographed, and um, you know it's just a, a totally different vibe when you're out on the coast because it's rocky, and and there's coastline, but it's not like beaches like you think beach in um, California or or back east. It's a very different kind of coast. They they don't call it the shore or the beach. They call it the coast in Oregon. Um, and then to go along with that, um, as you're going, no matter where you are along the coast, um, there's lots of opportunities for these giant rock formations that are that are offshore or in some cases kind of on the beach and they'll be submerged at high tide. Um, and then you can almost walk out to them at low tide. And these are sea stacks. Um, so the idea is um, they're, they're beautiful to photograph any time of the day, uh, but we like to be there uh, at the blue hour at twilight, um, either in the morning before sunrise or more easily, <laughs> more more um, humanely uh, around sunset, and you get those gold and blue, and depending on whether there's clouds, and and you can get some stuff. And then at that twilight time, like this shot is one of yours, Rick, and uh, you see that slower shutter speed. You're getting that motion of the wave actions as as it's receding there, which is really nice. Um, definitely want a tripod for this kind of stuff. And watch. Where the water is <laughs> yes yes you can a good pair of wellingtons can be can be helpful too out here sometimes yeah. we've done that um and then here's another one this is the kind of thing that you might get so i for this shot um which c stacks they were farther out but i chose to use a wider lens i was probably using a 16 to 35 or something like that for this photo got down pretty low and what I really liked is how the water receded and created those lines and you see those ripples and reflections. Um, and the sea stacks almost just become a background element in this shot. So lots of different ways to frame things up when, when you're photographing things in Oregon. And one of the things that you can play with that you can see in this shot too is just by timing when you shoot and where the surf is, you can get those nice reflections showing up you know, on the sand, just like you've got under the sea stacks. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, lots of different ways. And, and you know, one of the challenges with the sea stacks is to try to come up with ways to frame them in different compositions so that it's not all the same shot. And, you know, you try different things where, you know, where you make it a background object or, or you do something like a long exposure and you get swirling around them. It's pretty fun. And then, um, you know, other things that you can do, um, 
would be stuff like the uh, tide pools and, and the state parks. And why don't you talk about this a little bit, Rick? Sure. Um, one of the cool things on the Oregon coast is there are a, a bunch of nice tide pools and you can um, find them online. There, there are a bunch of websites that will point you to them and you'll find even printed brochures in a lot of the coastal towns that'll suggest where to go. But the thing that's fun about them is, you know, one, you'll you'll find a surprising amount of interesting uh, sea life and plants in them. And then they change with almost every tidal cycle. It's a little bit different. And um, they're fun to shoot with macro lenses, you know, a nice telephoto zoom works well. And then that same polarizer that we talked about earlier can be really important with the tide pools and just taking the reflection off of what you're shooting and, the, and then the water that's frequently around them. And a place that we'll talk about later is Haystack Rock in Cannon Beach. And there's actually a nice one that's right next to Haystack Rock that's pretty good sized. And you'll see all of these things that are in, in these smaller photos there. And I think these are a few of your um, shots that you took along the coast. Yeah, these were in one of the state parks. Um, I or I think they were in one of the state parks, or they were in um, a place that we plan on going back to. Or and and so it's not always just coast. Sometimes there's trees and there's moss, and you know I did I, I love doing the uh, the zoom blur upper upper right there. So I looked up in this forest and. I zoomed the lens with a slightly longer exposure, um, but lots of things to look at for close-ups. Like the, I love the patterns and neurals and the moss and the tree trunks, and and just finding things. And this, I think this was at Cape Mears. There's a lighthouse there, and there's a, it's a state park, I believe, and you can go yeah. there. Um, and so it's not just the seascapes when you're on the Oregon coast, you can actually find a diversity of things. So trees, forests, leaves, you know, close-ups, um, wood, weathered things. It's really great. Slugs. Yeah, slugs. Banana <laughs> slugs. Slugs are probably. great. Um, do they have banana slugs up in Oregon or is that just in Santa Cruz? I can't remember. Uh, and then uh, you also sometimes find marine life. So there was, you can see the, the sea stars, but here's the, the harbor seals out on the rocks, and uh, so sometimes you'll you'll come across these kinds of of, um, of critters that you just you just don't know. And and while we generally don't go looking for wildlife specifically, excuse me, it's really fun to um, encounter it, see seals, or you know you could potentially see whales, I suppose, or or other marine life. So yeah, and, and and sea lions too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, one of the things about the tide pools that I love is just the the diversity that's in them. Uh, there's all these different creatures, and they're just the, the they're so diverse. Um, I once taught an invertebrate biology class, and we had to identify all these things in tide pools, and it was so much fun because there's just so many things in there. You'll see crabs, you'll see. Uh, brittle stars and, and sea stars and then anemones and all kinds of stuff. And even if you're not taking great photos of them, they're still really, really fun to just look at them and see everything. So we are going to be doing a photo safari in May uh, to go back to Oregon, uh, May 9th through 13th. And we're going to do this out of Portland. Um, which will be a combined trip to the uh, Columbia Gorge area, as well as the coast. And we'll talk about those locations in a moment. Um, but, uh, and, then, and then for anyone who's interested, when we get back to Portland, we're gonna offer an infrared photography class on the 13th and the evening of the 13th, and then on all day on the 14th. Um, and, you know, we're really excited to to really be getting back to normal, right, Rick? Um, and uh, being able to 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 offer a a trip again um, 
so early this year. I think I think if you had asked us a few months ago, we wouldn't have been so sure about this, but we're feeling a lot better about it now. Um, the photographic opportunities in Oregon are just tremendous. So, I mean, you've got the waterfalls and streams that we showed you, and then all of the coastal seascapes, landscapes, um, you can do anything from close-ups to wide shots in there. Um, long exposures, not just the waterfalls, but there's opportunities for doing longer exposures to smooth out water um, on the beaches, on the coast. So you can you can create those interesting looks where the water becomes completely smooth or the wave action gets blurred. Um, we mentioned the tide pools and then just walking around the beach towns. There's all kinds of stuff. It's almost like travel photography uh, we'll be able to do, right? Um, and of course, infrared. We'll be bringing infrared cameras um, because all of that lush vegetation really looks cool. And, you know, it'd be pr pretty cool to have a, I think it'd be pretty neat to have photographs of some of those um, Columbia Gorge areas in, in infrared, um, quite honestly. Um, and because it's sort of a photo safari slash workshop, of course, we wouldn't do that without learning opportunities for anybody who joins us. And so we'll be doing photo review sessions. And we give post-processing lessons in the in the middle of the day or in the evenings, just depending, or in the morning sometimes, depending on you know what we're shooting that day, to 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 really get the most out of your photos. I mean, anybody can go there and click the button, but if you want to make a fine art photograph, it's good to know a little bit about post-processing. And so we'll be doing that, teaching Lightroom and Photoshop as well as some some plugins. Um, and then, of course, because we enjoy just being out in Oregon, there's always some other opportunities, right, Rick? <laughs> so definitely, you know. So um, if you like seafood, there's this seafood chain. Well, Rick, you're the one who knew all about it. I mean, I'll let you talk about it. Yeah, it's it's not a, a fancy chain or anything like that. Um, it's the one that my family and extended family always went to and started in Newport, Oregon, but called Moe's, and it's all up and down the coast and they have really good clam chowder. I think the secret ingredient is ridiculous amount of butter. And in that same vein, we'll be uh, making a stop at the Tillamook Creamery in Tillamook uh, where you can get really great ice cream and cheese and other things that are just very fresh tasting and wonderful. And it's a pretty area. Yeah. And Cape and, Mears is close by. And I've gotten word that the Tillamook creamery is even bigger now than when we were there 10 years ago mm -hmm. um but you know there is the mose but you can see the kind of town that you can do a lot of photography in this area of just little street details and things like that so um i want to just bring up our sort of itinerary our general itinerary for for what our trip is going to be um we'll be in portland for two nights may 9th and 11th, um, we'll have orientation on the evening of the 9th, and then on the 10th, um, uh, we will um, photograph the all day in the Columbia River Gorge, including those waterfalls that we showed you some of those photos of earlier. Um, then what we're going to do is we'll spend the, the night of the 11th in Portland, and we have hotel reservations already lined up. Um, and then we're going to make a drive, we'll, we'll caravan, and we'll, we'll leave Portland and we'll head to Astoria in the middle of the day. And Astoria is uh, a cool town. There's a coast town, it's north coast, northwestern part, west of Portland. And it's near Cannon Beach, which is where we're going to end up that night. Along the way, we're going to stop at um, Astoria, there's the bridge, there's a coastline, there's Victorian homes to photograph. It's very pretty if you just Google it. It's where they filmed some of the scenes from the movie The Goonies back in back in 85. Um, and then there's a fort, there's coastal batteries, there's a shipwreck place called Fort Stevens. We're going to shoot that on, on our way. And we'll end up in, in Cannon Beach and shoot that evening on the beach. And so then we'll spend two nights, the 11th and the 12th, in Cannon Beach. So we'll be staying, and I'll, we have a picture of this, but we're staying right in Cannon Beach. So we'll be taking photos of those huge sea stacks at Haystack Rock and Hug Point and, and Ecola State Park. Um, and then on the 13th, which is a Thursday, we will make our way back from Cannon Beach to Portland 
driving and making those stops. So we'll stop at Cape Mears, we'll hit the Tillamook Creamery, and we'll be doing photography along the way. We'll end up back in Portland that evening. Um, and anyone who wants to stick around um, extra uh, for our digital infrared photography class, we'll be giving the orientation that evening and then um, going out and doing a photo shoot on the 14th at the Portland Japanese Gardens. So to give you some ideas of like what, what it is, here's, here's some of our workshop participants from 2011. This is the Columbia River Gorge. So if you look out to the left there, that's the Columbia River. So you're, we're on the Oregon side. On the other side is Washington. And then as you continue down this road, this was just a particular viewpoint. Um, and these were some of our clients way back in 2011. And that's Rick there with the hat on um, in the back. Um, so we'll have, we'll have a good two days there and then we'll make our way. This is the bridge in Astoria. So you can imagine what you can do with a long exposure. This is just a photograph I found on, on Flickr. I don't have any photos of uh, Astoria. Um, and then we'll end up in Cannon Beach. And here's a photograph, again, not mine, but this is what Haystack Rock looks like. So we'll be wandering around. And again, good idea to bring a pair of, <laughs> of rubber boots or, or water waterproof uh, shoes. Um, and just to give you an idea um, where we're going to be staying, this is the this is the hotel where we're going to be staying. Literally, we can just walk out the back and be on the beach. There is no closer location to stay in terms of being able to photograph um, Haystack Rock at any time. So we can go out early in the morning. You can go out when we can come back in the evening, and we're going to be located right there. And I've stayed several places in Cannon Beach, and this was by far my favorite. It's it's really nice, and as Jason was saying, the the location is wonderful. And and by the way, the tide pool I was mentioning is just to the left left of Haystack Rock. So, yeah, so it's, that's going to be fun. Quite convenient. And then for those interested, when we get back to Portland, we'll be doing infrared photography. So here's an example of the kind of photographs we'll be we'll be making um, on on our extension at the Japanese gardens this is the Denver Japanese gardens but you get an idea of what what we'll be able to photograph with these cool surreal looking infrared photos um, now if you're interested in shooting in this area either with us or on your own we do have some recommended gear I'm gonna let Rick talk through this list a little bit Sure, and, and one thing I'll mention too, we didn't include a photo of it because, you know, for for this time we're emphasizing infrared. Um, but the Japanese gardens also have a very famous tree that has been photographed. I don't know how many times. I'm trying to remember. Is is it a Japanese maple? Yeah, it's one of those yeah. sprawling, you know, and it's not really that big. No, no. When Jason and I were last there a few years ago. <laughs> we hunted it down and we were just shocked. It's more like a large shrub, but it's it's very pretty. Very yeah, pretty. You get and under it's located it, there too. You get under it with a really wide lens and it's cool. And yeah. it, just, it makes the photos make it look big. So in terms of recommended gear for the workshop, and, and you can also obviously use this um, as a basis for things that you would take if you were going there on your own. Um, you know, just a good general DSLR or mirrorless camera works. You don't need anything exotic and you don't need the, the newest thing. Uh, we won't be shooting a lot of rapidly moving subjects. A mid-range zoom works surprisingly well for um, most of the, the subjects. Certainly the Columbia River Gorge, um, the sea stacks, all the, a lot of those kind of things work fine. You can get by pretty well in the tide pools. You definitely want a sturdy tripod. Uh, you know, in past years, a few people have come to the workshops with the really lightweight ones. And there are a couple dangers with them, especially on the beach. The waves can surprise you at times. And in fact, when you have a group, you know, like you have for a workshop that's together, usually you'll get in the habit of warning each other when the surprise wave comes in but it doesn't make take much to knock something over so you want to have a little bit of weight and uh, also have tripod feet that 
will float on the sand surface pretty well. You know, it's, so just imagine them having bottoms that are, you know, three quarters of an inch to an inch wide, ideally. Mm -hmm. So you don't get buried in the sand and have your tripod tilt on you. So a tripod is important um, for lots of things, including the, the gorge too. We've talked about the polarizer. It's super handy for a lot of the shooting and also works as a little bit of a neutral density filter. You want to have your favorite post-processing software. Um, Jason and I use Lightroom and Photoshop along with some um, plugins, but lots of things work well. It's whatever you're, you're used to. And then one thing I definitely would recommend is at the very least some waterproof hiking shoes. They don't have to be really elaborate, and and if you're flying there, you're going to be a little bit limited on space. So the wellies that, that Jason was talking about earlier are absolutely perfect, but pretty bulky for a, a suitcase. So at the very least, just make sure that you're not going to end up with, you know, wet feet at the end of the day through from some of those random waves or in the gorge area just going through wet vegetation. And then in the optional category, not a bad idea to have a little bit wider um, angle lens. Zooms are nice. Ditto on the telephoto end, and, and that is something that you can use for, you know, some of the detailed shots in the harbor towns, the tide pools, as I mentioned earlier. And if you really want to get into that, um, you know, the tide pool playing a 90 to 105 millimeter macro, some, something in that range works really great. They're nice and compact and light. And the focal length ends up being just about bright for most of the shots. Solid ND filters uh, are useful if you want to do some of the long exposure photography along the coastline. And if you recall seeing the shot that Jason put up of the bridge at Astoria. That's a great place to use it. I think we can also use it for the shipwreck um, that's up in Fort Stevens, just to smooth out the water and to give a little bit different look. If you combine that with black and white, it's something that can expand your shooting times during the day and just come away with more shots than you would have otherwise. Hey, Rick, mm -hmm. we, got a, we got a question in the chat box. Sure. Um, can you define what you mean by mid-range zoom? Sure. Uh, something like a 24 to 70, 24 to 85, 24 to 105, something like that. I would try to get down to 24, and um, as long as you can go, the better. This isn't something that requires a really fast aperture. So even something like a 24 to 200 can work really well on a trip like this. Cool, thanks. And um, the last thing on there is an infrared converted body. Uh, if you have one, it's a great thing to bring along. If you're thinking about coming with us, and we hope you do, and you've got an old body that's not been getting a lot of use lately, that's compatible with the rest of your equipment, might not be a bad idea to, to get it off to LifePixel quickly or one of the other companies that does infrared conversions. It, it really can add um, some choices to your shooting that can be really nice. Absolutely does. Um, I would uh, go so far as to say um, if you have questions about specifics on equipment, because if you're, you know, if you if you are interested in in joining this uh, joining this adventure, um, just send us an email. We'll we'll be glad to answer any questions, or you know, or even after we're we're finished with the with the uh, presentation today. So um, these are all really great things. I I can't think of anything to add to this other than your normal accessories. I mean, we'll be bringing a laptop and memory card, you know, all that stuff, right? But uh, you know, it really just depends on how you're getting there and, and, and you're going to be constrained on, um, you know, uh, bag size and things like that. Um, the big question that everyone has been asking and we're all asking is, is it safe to travel? And, you know, what are the rules, uh, you know, to Oregon, for example? Um, so, 
you know, we wouldn't, let me, I'm going to hand this over to Rick, but let me just say that we would not be even considering this safari workshop if we didn't feel confident we could, we could do it safely. Yeah, and, and just for clarification, both of us are vaccinated, and that was the thing that really enabled us to start thinking about this. And then, as you could probably tell, we're trying to hurry a little bit because um, there is a really good time to go, and it's based on the weather, um, when tourists are not as present as they are later in the summer, and then also we've tried to time this um, with tides, so, you know, for example, when we're in Cannon Beach at sunset, it'll be low tide, and it's just something that you've got to kind of schedule around. Um, but the vaccinations have been the thing that really enabled us to do this, and as you can see from the, the Oregon State travel guidelines, which we will absolutely go along with, um, if you are vaccinated, you don't have a quarantine period of 14 days. So that's huge. And that's really what enables all, all of this because it would just be awkward before. And and like we, um, Jason was saying, we're, we're feeling like this is going to be a safe thing to do, especially with the workshop environment and how we run them. Um, we're encouraging people to be vaccinated who go. We're not going to insist on checking anything, but it's a smart idea. And But we'll still keep good social distancing um, measures in place and other things. And that's easy to do there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and, you it know, for the, lots of space, the, the, the maximum number of people we take is eight, I believe. So it's going to be a small group no matter what we do. And so we'll be able to spread out even in some of the, in, in all the, the locations. And, and this little yellow box on the right, this is just, I pulled it from the CDC's website. So as of last week, the CDC here in the U.S. said, if you are fully vaccinated, traveling on aircraft is far more safe than what it used to be. Um, you still need to take your normal precautions, but but they're now saying that um, it's it's definitely something that you can, you don't need to worry about getting a COVID test before going anywhere. You don't need to worry about self-quarantine. So all this stuff is really huge in terms of what we're able to do. Now we have, uh, you know, in that same vein, you know, we we do have some commitments um, to to our to all of our uh, people who are our clients, and um, you know, Rick, the this is this is your job to talk about, Rick. <laughs> okay, I can talk about it. Um, first and foremost, and we love doing this stuff, so. Um, we'll try to make the experience as fun, relaxing, and safe as we can. Um, you know, Jason was kind of kidding around a little bit with the clam chowder and stuff. But we do try to make these social events, too, along with having some good photographic experience. So um, we'll do our best to, to keep up that um, history that we have. And, you know, one thing that I think is important to emphasize is, we're not going to make you do things. We're not going to force you into critiques or things like that. We're going to um, be there if you would like us to look at your image. We'll likely have some small group get-togethers where we show off our images a little bit on laptops and things like that, if you choose to. Nothing will be forced on you. And with the group size that we've ha we have, the reason we've picked that is, one, we want to make sure that when we go to some of these locations, you're able to get the shots that you want and you're not um, intertwined with someone else's tripod legs. But also, if you would like to get some ideas from us um, or just have questions on settings or whatever, you can get that support. We're not going to be hovering there um, unless you ask us to but we're more than happy to do it. It's, our reason for being there is teaching. It's not to get shots for ourselves. We'll do that, but it's not our priority. And I should just add, it's kind of like, I like to think of it as when we do a workshop together, this is, the workshop is your workshop, not 
our workshop. So the questions that you, our clients ask us, it's sort of like the ask me anything session, right? Uh, we we kind of go with the flow with whatever people want. Um, if you want help with settings, we, we give you help with settings. If you want ideas for creative compositions, that's what we're there for. You know, if you want to just go and do your own thing too, you can do that. Just don't get lost, you know? So it's all, it's all really, really kind of, we go with the direction that the group kind of leads us. Um, we're not going to sit there and say, you put your tripod legs here and set your camera to F8 and 250th of a second, <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, because there are workshops that do that. I mean, you know, if you want, if you want a drill sergeant, um, this isn't the workshop for you. <laughs> so, um, and this last thing too, it's it's this is kind of our philosophy, wouldn't you say, Rick? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, this is why we go. Me there will be ice cream. Well, there will be ice cream, and it'll be <laughs> some of the best ice cream you'll ever have because you can get like blackberry or marion berry ice cream and if you've never had oregon berry ice cream oh my goodness but no it's it's we we strive as instructors to to make sure that our clients go home with images they can enjoy and be proud of and have their family and friends say wow that's impressive uh not just a a, a card full of of snapshots and and checking a lot of boxes that said guess here i went to 20 different places and saw none of them <laughs> so um you, you want to come back from the trip being being invigorated and refreshed and feeling glad that you have invested some time in the photography equipment and learning and knowledge and experience that you can get and i think that's kind of where we try to steer it yeah, and I'll just add one thing. It, it's been a long, tough year for everyone. And we're looking at this as a way to break out of that and move to a little bit more positive period. And this was just the best place that we could think of based on our experience to do that. So we really hope you'll join us because we think it'll be a blast.